Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Oh. Hi everyone, thank you very much for being here. I know it's a really, really cold day, so thank you for braving the cold and joining us here. I also want to thank uh, our staff, Pete, Anne, and Jeff uh, for helping us put this together. And finally, I would, help, uh, I would like to thank our speaker, Pla uh, Claudio Perlick, who uh, is a chief scientist at uh, Distillery. Her research interests lie in the intersection of machine learning and digital advertising. She also teaches at NYU uh, MBA, uh, a certain MBA program. She has over 50 published articles, lots of awards, <laughs> and all those uh, whatever technology magazine that you can think of. At some point, they nam her named her one of the smart or smartest or you know most creative people. So we're very happy to have her here uh, today. She will tell us about the challenges of. Um, machine learning, data mining, and other analytical techniques in the context of digital adver advertising. So with that, Claudia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, so there are a lot of very familiar faces here. I warn you, you probably have heard part or all of the story before. Um, so um, I'm kind of transitioned from academia over research lab now into um, Advertising, the last place I ever expected myself uh, uh, to be, but um, that's where I am, and I found it to be a great sandbox to play around with machine learning. And so this is not going to be a very technical talk. This is more of a interesting overview of the things you end up uh, wrestling with um, that often aren't really of that technical nature in uh, digital advertising. And you can do me a favor and make this really interactive and ask me questions um, because that's a lot more fun for me then and um, hopefully also for you. So um, I'm one of those people who bother you all day long and uh, show you ads wherever you go and whatever you do. Um, so in particular, I'm going to be focusing on display advertising, meaning when you use your computer and you look at websites. We also do mobile and video, but I'm not going to get into much of that stuff. So let's just focus on how the hell did this ad get on that page when you were just trying to figure out what's going on in New York in the morning. So I'll give you initially a bit of a high level overview how programmatic advertising works. Now, what does programmatic mean? It basically means this is all real time, uh, real -time auctioning where we are buying those ads in real time. So it's a huge marketplace where ads get bought and sold. We are on the side of actually buying these spots and then filling them with an ad that we hope is not too irrelevant to you and ultimately leads to conversion. All right, so that's the business I'm in. Now, how does it work? That's my mom. Um, she's one of the two million 200 million people haven't figured out yet how to disable third-party cookies or install an um, ad blocker. And when she looks at the website, what happens while the site is loading is that this spot for display ad is sold through an ad exchange, meaning there is a request forward into an ad exchange, and there are plenty of those marketplaces, and then they come to me. Not me personally, but our company. And we receive currently about 30 billion requests per day. And that's after filtering a lot of stuff that we don't want to look at. So 30 billion times a day, I need to decide whether or not to show my mom an ad and for what, or anybody else for that matter. So we have about 100 milliseconds, typically less, to submit a bid price. And if we win the auction, and it's like eBay, it's supposedly it's a second price auction, although I'm not entirely convinced it's really second price from what I can tell, but that's kind of on the interesting sidelines. Then we get to serve an ad. So then I choose what campa campaign I want to advertise to you, and the ad loads on your browser. Anybody on board with the just kind of delivery side of things? 
I'm not an ad agency. I work on behalf of an ad agency. I might work either for a brand or an ad agency. But a good point. Let's actually try to get to where my money comes from, right? So far, I'm only paying. I need to earn something too. Now, the interesting question is what do I know at that moment to make that decision? I know where the person currently is, but I also know a cookie ID that I have assigned to the person. So I can look up browsing histories and additional information that I have collected about that person, and I have to do it in these 100 milliseconds, to make this decision. Now, where does that come from? Obviously, I get a lot of data directly from this side, because every time I get a bid request, somebody tells me that a person is on a website. We also have uh, data partners that help us um, kind of observe some part of browsing behavior that people show the rest of the time. And it's, we track about 10 million URLs. The question is, how do you parse them? So don't get hung up on the number here. So what happens there, there's a pixel on the page that, again, lets us put a cookie, third-party cookie, on the computer. And that is kind of the augmented history. Now, in reality, the cookie really only contains a 20-digit random number, which is the ID that we assign to you. But that is the key under which we store all the information that we collect for that person. So far, still no money made, only paid. OK, so how do we make money? We work with brands directly or with agencies. So let's say there is a marketer Citibank, Nike, whoever, run, wants to run a campaign with us. Prior to the campaign, we'll also put a pixel on that brand's either homepage or checkout page. So now, not only do I observe what you do when you just read, but I also see who goes there and buys something. That information automatically works also as kind of an outcome, the metric that we are held to. What is called a conversion in this game, some people still measure a click, but more interesting these days is after seeing this ad, within a given time period of, say, seven days typically, does the person who saw the ad show up at that brand's homepage and take some action that the brand says is relevant? It could be buying something. It could be in case of luxury cars, unfortunately, not too many people buy them online. It could be scheduling a test drive. Whatever the brand says is the relevant event they care about. All right. Questions about, that's kind of as deep as I'm going to get. Um, when does the information from the cookies come into play? Does it come in at the bidding stage or just at the certain stage? <laughs> it is kind of. The bidding and the serving is almost the same decision because I, in fact, I first decide that the best thing to show you is campaign X, and then I decide, are you good enough for X even? So it's kind of an integrated decision. So this information has to feed all right here into that moment. Now, I will be doing a lot of pre-computation because I can't do everything down here. So the system pre-calculates a lot of things. First of all, yes, every person is like people get uh, put into certain levels, and that's where I'm going to talk about the modeling and the prediction, the scoring. On top of it, even for the same person in the same campaign, I will bid a different price when you are at kayak versus when you're reading some random blog. I know you're a good prospect, say, for a travel campaign that I'm running, but if on top of it you're right now in kayak, I might, might multiply my bid price by 10. Because I know right now, kayak is a great kind of conversion. Is the marginal effect of being on, on kayak gives me another factor of 10 beyond knowing that you are anyway a good prospect. Are you actually taking the, the actual content of the page into account? We don't. And I'll show you in a moment what data we actually collect. So the only information we collect is the, literally the URL string. We're not going to scrape the page and try to figure out what's going on there. We're not even buying contextual information. Question about the conversion. So even if the person at the end followed the search ad and converted, they still will pay you? Now we're talking about one of the ugliest pieces of ad tech. It's called attribution. <laughs> uh, it means, chances are, before you convert, it wasn't just me who showed you an ad. 
there has been maybe a search ad in between, and 50 other vendors who are on the same business. So when, when that conversion happens, the question is who gets credit for it? And there are different schemes. There's last touch, which is problematic because you can game it quite, not easily, but people game it. There's a lot of research right now in multi-touch attribution, which borders on really asking a causal question of who drove the conversion, but it's a very ill-defined causal question. So um, we can have a whole one-hour seminar on attribution. I don't want to go there. Oh. It's a bad problem. And the solutions are even worse. Oh, I, I think the problem is hard, but in terms of like what is happening in the industry right now. Industry, usually it's last touch, meaning whoever was the last one to show an ad. Now, I don't know how different channels like search feature into this, but the vast majority is last touch. Yeah. So do you get paid per conversion? No. Excellent question. Business model is actually in bulk. I'm paid in bulk. So city comes to me and says, here 100,000 bucks, go, have fun. By the way, uh, we agree on a certain CPM, cost per uh, thousand, that automatically translates the budget into a number of ads I have to show. The performance at this point almost doesn't matter until we get to the renewal. And if your performance wasn't good enough compared to some other company they hired, they cut you out of the plan. Most deals that we have are of that structure, CPM. So the, perf the performance is almost a secondary um, metric. All right, so let's move on then. So if I actually care about performance, because the price is what it is, right? They have nothing to do with that. What in principle I'm supposed to be estimating, I want to calculate the probability of purchase given who the person is, inventory is, in this case, the New York Times, meaning where the ad is shown, or, or kayak, or a blog, and for people who I showed an ad to, and this means a new customer. So we don't try to do retargeting and show you an ad for the product you already looked at or bought, but we're actually trying to get you to buy something that you haven't bought yet. Okay? Now, what's the problem with this? If you followed me, or oh, I wasn't very specific, we track about 100 million binary URL indicators. So my data has about a dimensionality of 100 million. And conversion rate is typically low. No matter what product you look at, unless it's pizza, people don't buy very large amounts of them. And even pizza, people who for the first time buy a pizza are very rare, so that doesn't count even as an example. So conversion rates are really, really low. I don't have an awful lot of positive examples to start with. And actually, if I'm really picky here, technically picky, I have no examples to start with because I haven't shown an ad yet. I'm supposed to spend these 100,000 bucks, but before I've done so, I haven't shown an ad. So I can't estimate that part. So, all right, here is a step back. Let's take a look at the data we collect. What we have, and that is to the question earlier, we basically take the URL and hash it. So I get something like a time series of these odd hash events, and they're just indicators. So I'm not looking at the text on the page. So I'm completely anonymizing, not just the user, because the user just gets a number. I also make the actual browsing history very abstract very anonymous. So it's very hard to actually know what that person is. I, I can't tell you. So it's almost on purpose that we're trying to call this privacy by design. We're not trying to label people based on their behavior. They're not credit card intenders, but I'm really collecting just these URL indicators and purchases are locked separately. And so what this means really as a learning problem is I have a huge dimensionality array here up to 10 million, very sparse, very few URLs any given person ever gone to. And to make things worse, I don't have many positive outcomes either. Uh, is this mainly because of concerns of privacy or because this is convenient for further processing? I wouldn't call it convenient, but it performs very well. Okay. In fact, every time we try to add contextual information, didn't help because the URL kind of tells me it's, it's like an, um, the identifier 
contains all the information. It's just a matter of do I get enough positives to extract it? But any time we have tried to change that and augment it with additional information, it didn't seem to improve our performance. So it doesn't matter whether it's a hash of the URL that you can't reverse? It doesn't matter at all. It's, it's irrelevant. So it's just a binary indicator. And by the way, we also ignore the time series of it. We're not looking at the stuff you've done more recently versus older. Even that didn't seem to change performance much. Yeah? But what's sort of the, um, so each of these dimensions is independent. So if I have like 100 URLs that belong to the same parent company, they would all be treated as like extra Correct. I'm, I'm completely ignoring any possible structure that might be sitting behind it. Now, I'm not saying they are independent. I'm pretending they are. So the rows here are time? Or every row is a person. It's a cookie. A For every cookie, I have observed that cookie on a subset of URLs, in which case you get a 1. Otherwise, a 0. Typically, on average, somewhere between 20 and 100 non-zero. Not at all. I'm going to ignore that entirely as well. Any, t any attempt we did on using time hasn't led to major performance improvements. Didn't seem to matter. Yeah. Nope, we don't. We ignore that as well. It's slightly different for the bidding. The URL for the bidding, the information we get at bid time, there we use a lot more. In terms of augmenting, collecting your browsing history, we ignore it. Sorry, just the outcome is a conversion or not? So what I'm in principle trying to predict is the probability of a purchase or wherever the client puts that conversion pixel. I almost don't know. It's like. Every client comes to us and, and we agree on this is the outcome that you are after and that's the outcome you want to measure us against. And for instance, like uh, Pottery Barn, yes, it's the checkout page at the very end of the purchase. Okay? And so this business about context not helping, do you think that it just inherently doesn't contain information that's worthwhile or you think that you just haven't figured out yet how to... No, nope, it doesn't contain information given what I already know. The information I already have based on the IDs on the URLs the contextual information is not informative marginally on top of what I already have. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying you couldn't build a model from the contextual stuff. I'm saying you can't build a better model than the one I have. And what are IDs? That's the user ID? No, literally it's the, uh, it's the URL ID. So here, what is the column? Any attention to who the user is? No, I don't care. You don't think that matters? No, I know what you do. That tells me a lot more than who you are. Than anything you're willing to tell me about who you are. You are what you do. You are the websites you visit. Yeah. Exactly. That's my, that's my point here. We tried adding demographic information as well, and yes, it also didn't work. But what you're really saying is that you have not built a model that performs better given the... Yes, we have consistently failed for the last five years to build a model that beats this. Mm -hmm. And we have tried. It's a different story. That's a different business model. There are, there are companies that uh, specifically um, have focused on retargeting. Gridio is one of them. They play a different game. It's a different game. And it's actually measured, hopefully, differently as well. My task is I'm trying to find new people. That's what you hire me for. All right, let's keep going because... Um, so, how do you do that? Well, the reality is we solve a different problem than the one I told you I want to be good at. So the good news is a machine learning cheating is called transfer learning, so you're in good hands here. And there's a long uh, literature on that and how to do it. So instead of trying to predict this, I'll find myself a smaller problem. Now, it's not much smaller, but notably smaller. I'm going to say, OK, I will predict whether you go to that brand's homepage. And I don't care whether they buy or not. Forget that. I mean, whatever the conversion thing is, I'm just going to check whether they are even interested in this. And I also don't care whether they've seen an ad or not. Let's just figure out what kind of the organic propensity of going to that site and being interested. Now, the upside is I can do that pre-campaign. So now I no longer have to show ads, right? So I can build this model the moment I have a pixel on that brand's homepage. So I have something to target when I start. I still have the big predictive problem with a lot of dimensionality. So let's look at this a little bit more. We're not, as I said, looking at new purchases, but we look at any kind of site visitor, new or not. It's the first thing. Um, 
We're doing the things you really shouldn't be doing in machine learning. Never do that unless you have to. We pull the positives differently from the negatives. We take everybody who goes to the website as the positive, and then we pull some, other, some random set of other people that we haven't seen on the website yet as negative, which isn't really negative. So it's like going in a hospital and getting yourself a bunch of cancer patients and then walking down to Washington Square on the corner and uh, grab a bunch of <coughs> students that you run into as a negative set and then try to build a classifier for cancer or not. I don't recommend this. That actually only works because we have this kind of funky representation. And I, I can geek out on that topic if I want to. So, Brown, well, you could have a very focal graph and you get a sample of both the negatives and maybe yeah. some positives among them. How do you control them? That you don't get they exclude. So, we actually mm -hmm. we do check whether they were positives since we have seen the pixel. I don't know if you really never, ever, ever in your life bought pizza. But since we have the pixel up on the pizza place, we check that we haven't seen the you there yet since then. Um, negatives are everything else. Um, we will try to fix it later on. So there is this piece of transfer learning and, and stacking that we'll get into. Now, we have a couple of really brilliant people here who know how to do this. I'm not going to go into much detail of how to actually do that modeling. Um, the system we have built is a logistic regression it just works with that very sparse representation in 10 million dimensions. It's using stochastic gradient uh, descent. Comes with the usual bells and whistles, L1, L2 constraints, uh, depending what you want. So you have like a dimensionality reduction because we want our models to be preferably smaller just for kind of speed of retrieval. There's all this story about learning rates and so on. People in the room know about this. Um, again, stack of literature on this. Um, we can initialize models with industry priors we already have that we have kind of derived from previous campaigns in the same uh, domain. The models are not rebuilt every time, but they have like a streaming update. So every day we just collect a new set of positives, go find a new set of negatives, and then starting the stochastic gradient descent from the last known model and just incrementally update it with the new information. Um, that thing is fully automated. We build about uh, 10,000 of these uh, per week, and nobody ever looks at them specifically, right? I mean, we are like seven people that they are science group. I, I can't look at any of these. This thing just runs in the background and constantly updates. And there are a lot of um, tests around, is the model OK? Like, there's a lot of um, validation steps in between that I'm not going to get into. But this is basically the system. Any other questions on just the targeting? Yeah. So I'm missing uh, what kind of structure is being imposed when you, so, so you have many different sites for which you're trying to predict the probability of site visit, right? So we have. Are you learning an independent classifier for each one or? Here's the thing. If you were to use the information you got from the Audi website to run a BMW campaign, you only do this once. This is imposed. It's a legal problem. Even if I thought that it would be great news to use kind of competitive information. This is entirely siloed. So the outcome, meaning the campaigns we're running, they're completely siloed and they're treated entirely independent and they do not share any information. So where do the industry trials come from? So that's where the gray zone starts, where we have pixels on some campaign sites, but part of that data that we buy kind of brings in information about people going to brands as well. And that stuff we paid for belongs to us, and that can build kind of that background in industry. So does that mean for each of the URLs you know about, you have some additional information about the URL? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying for some of them we have. So the hash isn't, isn't like necessarily complete. For a subset, we have some information. Otherwise, I can't really show you anything in detail. By the way, how much time do I have? OK. There is, after this first model, what we call a stacking event, where we feed the predictions of the initial model into what's now a correct sample. So a week into the campaign, we have seen a couple of impressions, right? So now we can actually build a model on the people we showed ads to. And this is a kind of a random subset. It's kind of our control group. And we can estimate the same thing where we feed it the predictions from the previous model. It's like classical stacking, uh, sitting on top. And this plot here shows 
if you look at the uh, scores that the first model gives us, and higher is better here, and it's not a calibrated probability, the people that the model has the highest confidence that they have high probability of buying actually don't do very well. They're actually not the people, this is a calibration plot, who truly convert very well. And that's an artifact of this bias sampling and the other kind of less than kosher things that we did here. So there is a second layer that kind of fixes that part that accounts for some of the nonlinearities and the bias sample that we started with by taking the right sample. The other thing is I can also be much more flexible here with what I'm optimizing for, so a couple of opportunities. All right, so what happens? Well, once these models are done, we have them stored in the system. Every time we have a touch point, like a bid request, we check when was the last time we scored that person. And if it's longer than 24 hours, they get submitted to a scoring queue. That scoring queue takes the browser, looks up, and this is now not in real time, this is a queued system, looks up all the browsing information and scores that cookie against every single model we have in the system across all brands. And then it stores only those brands for which that cookie was in the top, like in the first percentile. So we pre-select who we consider interesting for any of the campaigns we're having. At the bidding time, so when the bid request comes in, we basically now look up, not directly the probability, but this kind of pre-calculated percentile that we have. And we do some adjustments for the inventory, meaning where the person currently is. So Duncan asked earlier, I'm saying, if you're right now on kayak and you are in a high percentile for a travel campaign, there's a good chance that the basic bid price we have for the campaign gets increased by a factor of 5, 10, because we know empirically, and this is again estimated, that when you're on kayak, your conversion probability is much, much higher. So it's kind of specific to each URL. To the 10,000 inventory IDs that we have broken out separately. So the dimensionality of this thing is smaller. Even though it's such sparse conversion data against any given Well, for the really small ones, we just don't have, and we go with the base factor. Right. If you get enough information to make a smart decision, do it. Otherwise, go with default. That's kind of how this works. For the so scoring? Yeah. Well, Maybe I in a perfect world, I would love to score a person every time I see them. Every time I get a new piece of information, I want to score them. Yeah. But we have like 200 million cookies going through. Okay. And just in terms of how many computers you want to own in order to do that, uh, 24 hours is good enough. The marginal benefit of scoring people more often, I'm not sure. I mean, you clearly have some kind of tapering off there. For the most part, it's pretty stable. So I would say, look, either you are a runner or you're not a runner. And if I'm running a campaign for Nike, unless you're remotely interested in running, there's no point, right? You don't change your behavior, like whether you're a runner or not, that vastly. So there is some movements, but for the most part, Yeah, we don't deal with those. Okay, okay keep keep going. Where you go? I'm just sort of wondering if you, if you're if you if you if you only show ads to people who are in the top one percent. Yeah. Right. Do you have enough people to show oh, all these ads to? Oh, I have about three hundred million people, right? Yeah. Maybe uh, that's three hundred million cookies, and you have probably multiple cookies for me, and I just see a different version of your personality in the different cookies. So when I say top 1%, that leaves me with 3 million. For most budgets, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> if we have a bigger campaign, what happens, I'm saying, okay, maybe I need the top 5%. And if it's a really huge budget campaign, maybe it's the top 10. So we basically just push down the cutoff on the percentile as a function of the size of the campaign. What do you mean across, I mean across campaigns? 
right? You have Once plenty. You okay. Overlap of all the one percent. I see. How much is left over that wasn't in any? How about I can tell you this? Uh, of all the thirty billion bid requests, we only bid five percent of the time, which tells you a little bit of how much room there is. So right now, with the amount of delivery we have to provide. We only bid 5%. That doesn't really answer your question because it might be they're the same people in all of the campaigns. Um, the internal competition, we often end up with you qualifying for two or three campaigns. And if I see you three times a day, then I can show you one for each. <coughs> so I don't think there's a lot of cannibalization going on as it stands. Eventually, if we actually were to grow the company by 10x, that's a problem. Then we have to maybe find more inventory. I think there's also a you mentioned clicks, right? I think there is a nice twist in this based on the fact that the actions, because they're not clicks, yeah. right? the actions that are taken are specific to the brand. And so, um, so the problem the people who visit every, day, right. every brand across the... So for clicks, it's actually worse. For clicks, his, his uh, concern is actually very valid because it's a much smaller group of people who click on all ads people either with eyesight problems or bots. And there aren't that many of them. So there is more overlap here because it's really product specific. I don't see this right now. I mean, between the key, uh, pizza campaign and the running shoes and the credit card, they're really quite diverse. But, sorry, depending on the conversion goals, somebody could click on the app and then end up on the page with the pixel. Absolutely the possible. Okay. But there are many other ways to get to the page, sure. usually. And you don't distinguish, for example, between an ad on kayak in the morning or evening or a viewable ad versus a non-viewable ad, things like that? So viewability goes into the bid strategy. We have bid strategies that, again, increase the price when it's viewable, but only for campaigns where the customer cares about viewability. Um, morning and evening, not specifically. I d we we have actually looked at that in terms of the incremental signal you get from that, given that you have a seven-day conversion window. Whether it's morning or evening almost doesn't matter, as long as I know that you convert within the next seven days. Again, the time scale here makes that irrelevant, unless you really try to game last touch. So for the last touch attribution, it becomes a bigger problem, and maybe we're not doing our due diligence on the timing in that context. If it's just about the conversion rate in seven days, it doesn't matter. Look, if the client is hell-bent on spending that money right now with us, what am I going to say? Come back next month? Okay. Yeah. That's not my choice to make. All right. Um, so how does that work now relative? And so um, this is a plot, and it's kind of on the more uh, geeky side. So here you have scale in terms of millions of browsers. There you have performance in terms of conversion rate. It's a log scale on both. And um, what we show here is for these different buckets that we have identified, the green ones are our prospecting groups. So these are people that we think are good prospects for this specific, this is one brand here. I don't know which one, but if I knew, I probably couldn't tell you. Um, the red points are the retargeting. This is where some of our uh, uh, like other companies, we can do retargeting if we have to, but we haven't specialized in that. And what you see for retargeting, um, the scale is much lower because there are only that many people have already bought it. Conversion rate is much higher. The prospecting, this is the, the green stuff here. Some of them is small, but generally the scale much larger. And we, we can kind of scale this out as far as we want, but for this campaign, the conversion rate is kind of a notch below. And then here you have what we call um, third party, the gray stuff, are segments you can buy, like... Uh, credit card intenders or, I don't know, soccer moms, whatever your heart desires, um, they tend to also span about the same area on scale in performance because they are not specific to that product. The performance ends up being notably lower than the prospecting. Um, the yellow are somewhat generic of these industry models that we have. And there's kind of a mixed bag, and I don't want to talk about mobile infusion. It's basically people that we've identified based on the places they have gone with their mobile device. But that gives you kind of a relative scaling of performance versus the number of people you can reach with this system. Um, right, this explains the same thing. How well does it ultimately work? 
in our internal measurement where we look just how the model compares to a non-targeted group, meaning if I just pick people at random and show them ads for the same campaign, the median lift is around 5x. Now, there are some campaigns that are really hard. These are products that almost everybody has. So things like credit cards are very, very difficult to get. A lift of two on a credit card is amazing. It's just simply because almost everybody has it. There's no signature. A campaign that you do really, really well on, one over here that we didn't show, is a supplier for scrapbooking material. Just close your eyes and imagine the audience of people who are interested in scrapbooking of, uh, supplies. They're very easily identifiable, and in terms of lift, if you compare it to random base rate, get a huge lift, easily 100. So this is just kind of across many different campaigns, what is the lift that uh, the campaigns typically have. All right, this is pretty much when I switch gears and talk about the next topic being fraud and then finally some causal. Are there any more questions about just kind of the prospecting piece here and how this whole system works? All right, then let's go in the fun stuff. Um, rule number one, um, every metric that can be faked will be faked. Just assume that to be true. And that holds for almost any outcome you may want to measure. The click, we see plenty of ads that we show in the US, and the click comes from Asia. I don't know how this works, but clearly many of these things are gamed. Viewability. Somebody tells you it's viewable 100% of the time. I promise you this will increasingly be gamed. If you achieve 100% viewability, for sure you're not showing it to real people. Because you never know whether the person scrolls down. There's just no way of knowing. Um, video completion. It's another one that we see a lot of gaming around it. And today bots are also starting to get really, really good at filling out forms and doing other things. What they typically don't do is buy stuff which is what you can't fake, but then it's also so rare that it's very hard to optimize against. So, let me tell you this story. Spring 2012 has been a while since, but uh, still kind of the same fundamental uh, concept here. The performance of one of our internal metrics doubled. So the lift across all campaigns over a period of two weeks, the median lift doubled. And we hadn't done anything. Now, usually that's good news, but in this case, um, maybe not. We started looking into it, and um, this was data we got from the bid requests, where all of a sudden, if a cookie was seen on women's health base, they also then were extremely likely to buy pizza, look at luxury cars, or download Microsoft products, uh, look at credit cards, and potentially visit the homepage of Sheraton. Now, I can't see any possible explanation of how this ties together. This kind of coincides with a huge uptick in what people call now non-intentional traffic. And it's not exactly bots. It's basically malware that's sitting on real people's browser software that generates um, HTTP traffic in the background. So when we say non-human traffic, if, if you look at this, it means you just didn't want to go there. And you probably don't even know that your computer requested that site. What we're going to look at the traffic patterns where we look at overlap between websites. So in the next graph, the red dots are websites. And there is a connector if at least 50% of the cookies who went to this website within a short period of time also show up on the other. All right? So we're just looking at where these cookies go. Um, this is kind of a graph what the world looked like in 2010. So let's look inside. This was here, the little thing down there. That's the Boston Herald and Boston Search. It kind of makes sense. There's an overlap of after, uh, up to 50% between those websites, right? They're all about Boston, somebody who goes there who wants to read something. So this is probably human behavior, this kind of co-visitation and overlap. Um, what about women's health base and these other strange things? Um, right there, there's women's health base in the middle of that cluster. 
Imagine how much time people must have. They're looking not just at women's health base, but all these other sites are visited by cookies who went there. I also want to point out the very diverse interests here. Um, China on TV, wrestling news, um, you take your pick. Again, a connection means 50% of the cookies from women's health base also went to however you spell this thing, um, wrestling news. So this is basically the bot traffic. This is non-intentional. There is some process in the background that generates these visitations to these websites. And the websites, I argue, have been built specifically to then sell ads on them through the exchange that are never seen, or at least not seen by any human. So what it comes down to, you're trying to decide when the bid request comes in, is there a person on the other end? And did the person really want to see this site before you make a decision to bid? Now, I can't really show everybody a capture before I show you an ad. It would be really annoying. Um, so this is the progression into 2012. And I haven't made a new plot since, but it probably doesn't look any better. Um, now, what has this to do with performance? So far, I haven't told you anything that would explain why performance of our system goes up, right? It's just more traffic. Well, the owner of the bot, who is working with the guy who owns Women's Health Base, figured out that you can get a lot more money for the same ad space if before the bot goes to Women's Health Base, it visits a couple of brand websites. Why is that? Because that's called cookie stuffing. Now you enter the retargeting pool where people bid a lot more money on showing you an ad. Because usually on retargeting, the prices are higher, uh, the conversion rates are higher. So that also means that the web analytics of those sites are probably questionable. What worries me is that now, since I'm modeling against these events too, my models learn how to identify bots, because bots go to homepages much more often than real people. And it's really predictable because bots are semi-deterministic as compared to the usual kind of human behavior. So if you look at conversion events or pixels that people track to measure the effectiveness of campaigns, more than 50% of the clogs, Hispanic home, pay, home care video completes were bots. Of course, whether you actually complete a video is a very good metric, right? It means that you were really engaged in the ad or that you were a, b a bot. And you see pretty much the who, <laughs> who is who on this list in terms of the bot traffic that you see going to these sites. So what we build is what we call the penalty box, where we exclude anybody that we see on these sites that have very high overlap, meaning we are not recording any information so that our models can't learn from it. We don't record the outcome, and we don't record the sites that they go to. Now recently, all of a sudden, the New York Times showed up as having very high overlap, which is disturbing because either they are buying bot traffic, which I doubt, or something is wrong with my algorithm. Well, it turns out this is spoofing. This is somebody pretending to be the New York Times and selling ads in the exchange under the URL New York Times, except that they aren't. Here you see the, the traffic. So these are the number of bid requests. And this is one exchange. This is the regular amount that we get, which is indeed the remnant uh, inventory of the New York Times. And then one exchange all of a sudden had huge spikes in availability. And this was a spoof website that just pretended to be the New York Times. And again, visited by bots. Very quick question. So uh, for the uh, cookies that you pay for, the, the, the 10 million, what was it, 10 million people or so forth, can you yeah, parameterize these bots so that you don't pay for them? Or you actually no. pay for them and, and then afterwards you don't? No, so we work with aggregators that give us access to these 10 million yeah. sites. Yeah, but you can't be like, I'm not going to pay for the bots because like... No, know. but yeah, okay. I'm not even sure they know and have the technology. All right, last topic for the day, unless there are any more questions about uh, the kind of bots and, and fraud story. Last topic of today I wanted to touch on is, well, does it even matter whether we show ads? If you listen closely to me, all I've basically said so far that I'm able to find people who would buy that thing anyway, whatever that thing is, right? I haven't at all spoken about the fact that I'm trying to 
measure whether I can bring people to do it or what, how much I can influence somebody's willingness to buy something. I'm just good at figuring out whether you would have bought it anyway. Um, so we're looking again in this context of having post view conversion within seven days. Now, if you just look at the conversion rate of people that I showed ads to and people I didn't, that's obviously not causal. If I'm worth anything, I mean, if I did anything right so far, of course I can find people who are more likely to convert. That's what I spent the last 40 minutes convincing you of, right? So this is clearly not a right measure of the impact. What you need to do is you have to account for the confounding that is introduced by the targeting that I've put in place here. So one option is, if you really want to know whether it worked, you can hire Nielsen. And Nielsen will assess whether or not your campaign was effective, right? Because they will come up with a comparable group and they will match it and then they will track things. And this was a campaign for Clorox. Nobody buys Clorox online anyway, so they are tracking it to um, offline buys in stores. Now let me zoom into this. So the blue line is the number of boxes of Clorox bought by people we showed ads to. And the yellow is the number of boxes of Clorox bought by people we didn't show ads to that they had matched. This is the memory test. Do you remember when the campaign started? Anybody? May. That's memory or based on this graph? Uh, All right. If things worked well, where, based on this graph, should the campaign have started? <laughs> March. But guess what? It didn't. So what does it tell you? That Nielsen can't adjust for the confounding that I've introduced. Because I know a lot more about people than Nielsen does. I mean, when Nielsen thinks it does uh, matching correct, it actually s knows less about people and as a result, we knew all the way along that we had the better audience. And so the 7% lift that were attributed to our campaign, I feel very reluctant to take credit for. I mean, look, the customer's happy. I'm not going to complain, but um, maybe the lesson is that you may not want to hire Nielsen well, if you really care about the answer. Anyone that they, their campaign wasn't covered? That's a different question. I'm not going there. Yes. This is actually, okay, don't tell anybody I showed you. This is a deck we got from Nielsen. This is literally pulled out of a Nielsen report for our campaign. So what puzzles me though is that the light That they actually send me this data. That puzzles me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that their stats, they're like right in line with one another, sort of pre-marked. So it could be possibly that somebody else had a campaign that identified the same. But then why was I able to figure out who else is in the market, uh, who else is advertising? Still doesn't explain why that's a correlation with me, unless I'm better than I think, because I don't know that. I think Sean was saying that maybe they're targeting for the exact same reasons, and so they end up targeting other companies. Might be. In any case, this is not really the answer to the question. At, at least I don't think that's the answer to the question whether I cost any more Clorox sales. Whatever it is, answer it. <laughs> so what I don't have time to go over, but what I want to uh, emphasize here is that A-B testing is difficult and accounting for things. It's also too expensive for most, uh, com uh, most uh, brands to uh, be willing to engage. Instead, what we looked at was, can we measure causal effect from observational data during our campaigns with the targeting and using analytic solution to adjust for the confounding that's introduced? And I will be very brief on this. Basically, uh, this is kind of um, from the Berkeley School, the uh, outline typically in terms of baseline variables, then you have an interaction, this is the ad or not, and then you try to estimate how this accounting for the, all of the um, baseline variables, which explain the confounding, hopefully, if you have accounted for everything, which you don't really ever know, um, and how it affects uh, your outcome. And so this is the uh, Bayesian formulation of this. Um, what we use is targeted maximum likelihood in estimating this. I don't have time to go you into the details. If you're interested, please let me know and I'll send you something. First thing, whenever somebody claims that they can go do causal estimates, do a negative test. Do pizza ad change the rate at which people sign up for credit cards? 
they better don't. Because if your pizza ad change the rate, then you clearly haven't accounted for something, or you're actually measuring some unintended effect. So here, actually, there no, was a telecommunication on uh, pizza. And what you see in the uh, estimate is the p-value. Um, so the difference in the conversion rate with add and without is completely negligible. So a negative test works out. We did an A-B test for this particular campaign just a couple of weeks prior. And we actually see that the observational method that's running purely on campaign data gets very, very close to the actual effect that the A-B test showed here. Um, you can do that now once you have the machinery, you can measure for almost any campaign what the true effect that you had uh, on the campaign. And uh, one of the things that you see here, we did some retargeting, that the creative should be matching the audience. So if you have a retargeting campaign, you should use a different creative. You see a huge impact here. And for the prospecting, that creative was completely useless. Now, we found this thing. Nothing going on whatsoever. Really rare. We debugged it for a while. Let me show you the creative. Any idea what we're advertising? A hotel chain. So you might get people to click on this. Doesn't mean they ever book a hotel a room with you. So this is 15 years of click optimization uh, affecting creative design, which has pretty much no impact whatsoever other than getting people to click on it. Finally, and that's my closing slide, um, how does what we do, finding people who would convert anyway, relate to who are the people who are most impacted by the ad? Because it's not obvious what the relationship is. What we look at here is, this is the basic propensity of the people to convert. So higher over here, lower over there. On the y-axis, you have the marginal effect of the ad. And although super noisy, the good news is that there's generally a positive trend, which means that people who are by nature more interested in your product are also the ones who are most affected by the ad. And if somebody doesn't care whatsoever about scrapbooking, no matter how many scrapbooking ads you show them, they will not change their opinion. I'm not going to debate kind of the incentive problems of the uh, industry. At the end, if you want to share this, here are the papers that you can go if you want any more details on any of the things we talked about, um, the publications we have on the topics. Mm. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so maybe we have time for two questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you said earlier that you thought that the auctions were not second price auctions. Why do you think so? And do you think there's any way for you to uh, account for that in, in your pricing models? Yeah, so the, the, the great news about second price auction is that you don't have to worry about it, and you can just bid what you think it's worth to you, and you're good. The reality is, and that's why I don't think that it is a second price auction, because there are far too many instances where we pay exactly what we bid. Chances of this happening in a second price auction are rather low. So certain exchanges and inventories, I see 80% of the time I pay exactly what I bid, and with some, back, like, some engineering, you can often see relationships. You always pay 10 cents less than you bid, or you pay kind of a certain midpoint of the distribution. You find spikes in the distribution of what you end up paying. There's no reasonable uh, explanation for that. Now, they are now called dynamic floors. That's the official way of saying I'm not doing a second price auction, except that I don't tell you where that floor comes from or how I calculate it. So it's very hard for me to now do smart bidding decisions if I don't really understand the mechanism. We do some experimentation around this right now to understand that better. We don't have the solution I would want, but it's in the works. Um, so the last time in spring 2012, mm -hmm. you spotted a, sort of a normal uh, performance, then you sort of discovered the fraud or the yep. bots, and then you mo uh, adapted the model uh, to sort of Ignore that, that part, yeah. But then we can also imagine they will come up with more sophisticated... Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is like the spam problem. That people constantly further develop the way these things um, are uh, um, 
they're evolving and um, I'm not saying that we have the solution. The advantage of this approach is the bots require scale. You only, I mean, you can only really make money with the bot business and putting up these sites if you get scale. So they have to have high loads of traffic. Uh, we keep looking, knowing that somebody is trying, I d but it might very well be that I don't know. And the other problem is um, bots perform really well if you look at viewability or click rate or uh, homepage visitation. I mean, I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are very, very happy advertising to bots because it makes your campaign look great. Probably as, as good as my Nielsen. One last. <laughs> 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 and I think that, especially since we're at my MSR, right? I mean, there's a huge industry on ad fraud, right? Yeah. And there are there is actually a huge industry now in dealing with ad fraud. So white ops and integral mm -hmm. and so on are dealing with it, right? So for any of us who are doing research <laughs> uh, that's using online advertising data, um, you better be really, really cognizant of yeah. the ad fraud because it may be that really the reason you get really good results are essentially because you're modeling something that is sort of much more deterministic than human behavior. Also means I'll be in business for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that note, uh, let's go and drink some wine. And Do that.